Well, your opportunity to put your calls, your questions and possibly your concerns and fears to Britain's top cop, as he's often called. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir Bernard Hogan Howe, is in the studio with me. Sir Bernard, you're a very busy man. Thank you for finding time to come in and take calls for, for half an hour with me. And I'd like to start with that question. It was within the last few weeks that you told a number of MPs, £800 million worth of cuts, Commissioner, possibly 5,000 officers. You also made the point that this would damage neighbourhood policing, which I don't need to tell you, but to explain to my listeners, that's where your men and women get to know what's going on in certain communities. How are you going to cope? Well, good morning, Nick, and thanks for this opportunity to talk to the people of London, and I hope to reassure them. There's a danger that we all go away and panic about what happened in Paris, terrible, terrible events that we're all very, very shocked by. But it's my job to put in place plans to keep them safe. And that's what we've been announcing over these few days. So the first thing I've done is to uh, order that there will be more firearms officers available every day on the streets. We have armed response vehicles. I'm not going to say how many, for reasons that are obvious. How did you know that was going to be my next question, Mr Bernard? But we've increased them by about a third. Mm. That's quite a significant undertaking. uh, But I'm determined that we are well prepared should anything like that happen here. The second thing I've done is order that there is a full team uh, available uh, 24 hours a day waiting just in case that terrible thing which we hope won't happen and I think generally is unlikely to happen uh, just in case it does happen and we've done all that within our existing resources and then the next thing I'm going to do is over the next few weeks is to decide how we uh, create a mobile response a further mobile response but we'll announce plans of that within the community. What does that mean, Commissioner, mobile response? Well I think what we, what we, I'm sure what the public understand, I know you do, is that we are an unarmed force we're proud of that. There are only probably four forces in the world that are unarmed, despite this huge city, despite this huge country. So we have 32,000 officers at the moment, and only 2,000 of them are armed. And as you know, you see them protecting Parliament, you see them, well, you don't see them protecting uh, high profile individuals. And we have our armed response units, and we have our specialist teams, should we have to go into buildings uh, when it's a planned event. But I think what Paris showed us with so many attackers with so many scenes moving around at speed, we need to have a a mobile reserve. I've got a good idea how that can be achieved. And over the next few weeks, as I've worked all that detail out, we will be announcing it. It won't necessarily need more resources, but it will mean that some of our officers have to have another skill. Have we got enough armed officers? Uh, I think at the moment we're fine. I I, I point you to Paris and you'll be aware there are 40 times more armed officers in France than there are in the UK. This is the whole of the country. And we hear about something called multiplicity of attacks now, Commissioner, which just to explain it's where, let's say something kicks off at a football stadium Mm -hmm. in London and then a shopping centre and then a cinema. Have you got enough men and women with guns? I believe we have at the moment. And so therefore people should be reassured by that. But what I've said is that, you know, I've just explained to you is that we're working up plans now so that in a short period of time we've got an extra, I would think, probably about another third on top of the core provision. So what I've said to you already, the arm response vehicle element, we're increasing by a third straight away. But then the overall pool, uh, I want to increase probably by a third overall and also at any one time on duty, probably double. So these are the sort of things which I think are reasonable response because what we don't want to do, surely is we don't want to knee-jerk towards a new type of policing where everybody's armed. I don't think anybody's arguing for that. But I think this type of attack shows that the police have got to be ready, flexible and enough reserves in depth. And just before you take your first uh, question, Commissioner, uh, 2,000 more spies we heard about from the Prime Minister yesterday. Fantastic. Have you got enough boots on the ground, enough blokes and women to actually... All that intel that comes in, have you got enough people out on the front line to actually go and do anything with all this intelligence they get? Well, first of all, Nick, um, I'm making decisions with the resources I've got. I I'm sense pe- you haven't then, Commissioner, I'm, with the way I'm, you answer. Well, I, I, will, I will answer your question directly, I promise you, is that I'm making decisions with the resources I've got because uh, I think this is what I need to do to keep London safe. This London that we know we love, uh, that I love, and I also love the officers that I lead, and I've got to keep them safe to go forward on behalf of the public. So I'm making those decisions now that I can. The government is clearly making its own decisions. We've seen these announcements that you've seen over the last few days, and I know, because we're in dialogue with them, that they are considering the needs that we've got I make my decisions, and it's now time, obviously, for them to make theirs. So there could be a review and the, the cuts that were coming your way? I don't know. I can only say that, obviously, all of us, I think, including government, I was in Cobra on Saturday, uh, and I know that all members of government, the Prime Minister, uh, the Home Secretary, all take very seriously our safety, and I know that they are seriously considering what does this mean for the UK and London in particular. Uh, I know they're sincere in that. Uh, of course, we will hear the decisions over the next couple of weeks. Put your headphones on. It's time to get to, through your opportunity, of course, to call the Commissioner here on LBC. And the first one through is Dure in Greenwich. Dure, go ahead. You're through to Sir Bernard. Good morning. Good morning, Dure. Sir Bernard. Um, 
I want to say, firstly, um, I think that you're doing a great job. Um, and I think the police, for, British police force, I mean, it's quite commendable what you do. Um, and um, I have no complaints. Um, I would like to say I'm a British Muslim. And uh, this, these Paris attacks that have just happened, this is literally a wake-up call for Britain. And um, I feel that um, everyone, it's not just our safety, it's everyone's safety. And But for British Muslims, I feel that it would be good to have a, um, a police presence, a visible police presence outside mosques, um, because there has been backlash, and there does tend to be backlash after um, incidents like this. Okay, so Andrew, that's, first that's of all... one of the things. Sorry. Okay, let's just get the... I will come back to you. Let's just get some police guards outside mosques. Yeah, well, first of all, Andrew, thank you for the compliments about British policing, because it's nice to hear. I think it... I believe it's right, but of course, but it's nice to hear from someone else. Secondly, in terms of mosques, we do, in terms of our high-profile places, uh, after this type of event, we do increase patrolling there. I think you might understand it's hard to get an officer outside every venue all the time because we have to look at synagogues, we have to look at mosques. Um, there are high-profile buildings. At the moment, obviously, we're interested in French interest property, obviously the embassy, um, but there's very there are quite a lot of French people who live in, uh, in London, probably a quarter of a million French people, plus all the businesses and associations. So we do have quite a lot of... Um, property that we need to keep an eye on some we keep officers outside all the time and the rest we increase our patrolling so i hope you do see more patrolling at the mosque difficult at times to keep an officer there all the time deray you wanted if you can keep it brief if there's another question please yes no i did i um i just i want to just add one more thing that yes. um i think that um Police do need to be armed. I mean, what's happened in Paris is a wake-up call. And I think it's not just about increasing some armed officers. I think all the police need to be armed. And I think the government needs to give the priority to the police in this regard. You know, if, if they're getting cuts, they shouldn't be getting cuts. It should be priority would, for the police. Just, just briefly, Duray, you would be happy for every officer in London to be armed, would you? Yes. Commissioner? I think, Jure, one thing we've all got to keep an eye on, you know, when politicians, and to be fair, people like me say that, you know, we don't want to lose our way of life just because of what these terrorists do. This is just one aspect of it. So we've got to be really careful that we don't overreact and give these people the very thing that they want. So that if we arm all our police, when generally we wouldn't do that, we've been, we've got a great tradition and we've all believed that policing by consent means that an officer can go into the middle of Leicester Square, carry out their job, enforce the law, they don't have to have a gun. Why would we throw that away just because of some of these horrible people who've done such a terrible thing? So I think if that does ever come, and I hope, you know, please God, it doesn't come. But if it ever does come, I don't think it should be on the back of one awful event. We've got to think very carefully about these things. But I think what we should do, which is what I've said to Nick already, is that we should think clearly about having more officers better equipped more available. Let's talk a little bit, Dure, thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the equipment, Commissioner. You, you may have had sight of an article in one of the newspapers today, the Daily Mail, by Kevin Hurley. He was head of counter-terrorism with the City of London Police, DCS at the Met, Territorial Army Officer, now Commissioner at Surrey Police. He talks actually in quite detail about guns. He says in Paris, the killers usually use an AK-47 Kalashnikov, an automatic machine gun that fires 7.62 millimetre rounds at a right rate of 500 a minute. He then makes the point that the guns that your officers are carrying are simply no match. They're the ARV Vs, the G36C, I don't know what I'm talking about, and the AR-15 Defender. Both, he says, high-velocity capable weapon, weapons, inadequate for combating the newest breed of terrorist. Their calibre is only 5.56 mil. They cannot be fired automatically. In a head-to-head -head confrontation with the Kalashnikov, the police officer will be defeated. Your guy's got the wrong guns. Well, Nick, I, I know Kevin, and I like him, but I think he's been foolish to talk in great detail about our capability. Um, I've not read the article. I've had an account of it. Uh, so we never talk about operational matters. And the reason but I have to put this to you I, now. I realise I realise that, but I'm just explaining why I won't respond in detail. Um, our officers need the um, all the benefit of surprise that we can achieve. So that means we don't talk about the sort of weaponry we've got. We'll all re always review what we've got, but I'm not sure what the aim is of talking in a public. Um, to give your blokes, better gun, your blokes and women better guns. But you don't have to sir. talk about the detail to make that point. So I don't think it's a wise thing to do. What I've said already you know, to you and obviously we're saying to our staff is that we are reviewing what we've got and whether or not we are fit for purpose. Now, over the next few days, I'm going to get together our firearms commanders and including the team leaders who are out there on the ground and ask them what do they think as a reflection of what we've seen in Paris because I want to hear from them directly. Um, of course, we'll always consider whether we're, we need more equipment, um, but at the moment, I can't agree with Kevin having such a public debate about such an important thing. Is it true that many officers in the Met are instructed to carry only 15 rounds, although their magazines can carry 30? 
That's exactly the point that I will not respond to, Nick, for reasons that are, I think, you will accept obvious. Is it true that the long-standing British police tactic in firearms negotiations has been, quotes, contain and negotiate, but this is latest Islamist outrage is what's known as a game-changer? Well, I think, to be fair, we thought that really post-77 and post-9-11. Uh, we've changed our attitude drastically, really, because when the person that you are trying to arrest is prepared to commit suicide and doesn't mind being, doesn't mind dying in the process of killing other people, you've got to change your mindset. So we've already done that. Um, but it does show how difficult it is, because as you quite rightly say, people who are old enough, perhaps us, will remember back to the, uh, the embassy siege, yes. where, of course, everybody stood off, and right at the very end, uh, the SAS went in and, and did what they had to do. But that was when we thought we could negotiate with people. Here so, where we see, if you look in Paris, that it appears within minutes of going into that building, they started to kill people and carried on killing people. You have to intervene quickly. So that's, I'm afraid, is a, a mindset which has been changed before Paris, but probably the problem has been emphasised by Paris. I know you're really loath, and this is the last one, but the French have, in this com commissioner's view, sorry, commissioner, they have better guns. Can I take it from you that if we need better guns, they will be obtained? Of course. Zane is in Wapping. You're on the radio, Zane. Good morning. Morning, all. Um, morning, Zane. Yeah, so, good morning. Um, yeah, my view is, you know, the Paris attack and whatnot, it's just a recruitment campaign from ISIS. They're trying to just sway ordinary <laughs> Muslims to flee to them. And we've seen recent cases of it happen. So what I really want to know is, what are British police going to be doing in specifically attacking radicalisation and whether you think it is a viable route for the police to be in direct contact with those who own mosques and run mosques just to get a better grasp of what's going on in the mosque and to ensure that the right message is being relayed to the people who attend those mosques. Well, first of all, Zane, I think what we ought to remind everybody, should they need reminding, is that 90-odd percent, 99 percent, I would say, of Muslims are good people who want to live a good life in this country and have, want nothing to do with this barbaric, awful behaviour. Um, so just because they happen to be Muslims and just because these terrorists are acting in, they say, in the name of Islam, uh, that doesn't mean to say that uh, we accept that. So I think we've all got to be determined to condemn uh, that sort of behaviour. Uh, secondly, we all, are already doing an awful lot. Uh, we are going into our mosque, our community officers, Nick said right at the beginning, you know, it's a broad policing tapestry. It's not just the firearms officers. It's not just the counter-terrorist officers. We've got to be out in our communities talking. And what that means is it's not just about talking. When people trust the police, when they know them enough to trust them, then what happens is they tell us stuff. They might tell us who's birdling. They might tell us where somebody who is wanted is hiding out. And they might tell us when somebody's becoming a terrorist, when somebody's become more radical in their behaviour. So we've got to have those vital links. And more and more over these last three years, now probably about two-thirds of the leads that we get around terrorists are coming from the community. So that's what we do. One, to get out there and talk to people. Number two is, where we can, we put people into something called the channel process, which de-radicalises or tries to de-radicalise those who seem to be on that that terrible path to uh, this awful sort of behaviour. Madeline's in Edgeware. You're through to the Commissioner. Go ahead, Madeline. Morning, Sir Bernard. Morning, um, Madeline. As, as a member of the Jewish community, who, as you know, are a major target for terrorism at the best of times, um, I can say we feel particularly vulnerable at the moment. Like, no other ethnic group in this country needs to employ security guards outside their schools and places of worship, etc., as you know. Mm. Um, I have two quick questions for you. Um, what, would, what is the possibility of having bags checked at the entrances of stations, shopping centres, restaurants, theatres, proper security, um, as a, a measure of prevention, perhaps? And um, so I, I'd be interested in, in your view. I think, Madeline, they are reasonable steps should they be needed, and I'm not sure they are at the moment. I think, you know, we've got to bear in mind that this happened in Paris. Um, the bag checks, I'm not sure, would have made any difference in any of these attacks from what we hear. We're still waiting for the detail. Um, we do get that sort of checking, as you know, going on an aeroplane. We do get uh, pat-downs going into football matches, and certainly tonight at Wembley, uh, we will see that. What will but, we see, Commissioner, exactly in Wembley? Well, first of all, you see more police officers than we normally put there. How General, many are you throwing at it? Uh, we've got a few hundred that we'll be putting there, and we'll also have firearms officers Is that enough? Overtly. A few hundred? I mean, there's going to be, presumably there's about 80,000. Oh, it might not be a full turnout, I suppose. There's tens of no, thousands. No, I think we're thinking 80,000, but I think, you know, we, we usually police football matches for the amount of football violence there might be there. We're not expecting any tonight. So these are people that essentially are there to reassure. We have no intelligence that someone will attack this game. Um, but the France football team playing within a few hours 
of that terrible attack in the Stade de France when they were playing Germany, it would be a bit odd if we didn't respond in a common sense way. So we're going to see a few hundred officers protecting people, but also, I believe, reassuring. We're going to see overt arming. I'm going to be there, symbolically, really, because I think, you know, I want to be alongside... Prime Minister's officers. attending as well, isn't he? I believe so. I think, you know, I think a few people are going. I think Boris is going to uh, you know, just show support. Duke of Cambridge. Really. Yes, so I think there's a few people. Of course, what that brings with it is a protection requirement yes. for our people then. Um, so our, our view is that we want to stand alongside the French. We want to make clear that we're with them. We want to keep them safe. I've already said that a quarter of a million, quarter of, a million of them in London. So it's our duty to keep them feeling safe as well. For the French people, I'm sure seeing officers with firearms is not unusual. It will be for the Brits who are going. So I hope they're reassured by it, not worried by it. But I hope also they understand that we're doing it for a purpose, which but is to solidarity. But you don't see solidarity. this at Paddington, Charing Cross, Victoria stations. You never, you don't see that day. Well, actually, no. I mean, at the moment, of course, British Transport Police do patrol our big railway stations with firearms. You know, you see that that's a British Transport Police uh, commitment. What I think Madeline's talking about as well is whether we'd see bag search on interest big supermarkets, yes. big places where people are, you know, where the crowds of yeah, people. Yeah, Westfield or whatever. I don't think at the moment that's necessary. Um, there may be a day when it comes, but please God, it's it's not going to be soon. Madeline, thank you. Steve's in Epsom. Steve, you're on the radio. Your question. Yeah, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, um, Steve. Firstly, firstly, I would like to say I think Sir Bernard's doing a superb job for the Met. Um, I do believe we've got the best police in the world. I'd just like to say that. I know you don't get that very often, Sir Bernard, but you're doing a great job, mate. Well, it's kind of you um, to say so. A few that, other people disagree, Steve. Yeah, that's, I can a, tell that's you. enough of that, Steve. <laughs> on to the questions. Yeah, don't let him... Any... Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go can on. you get me off my parking fine? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if what it was leading to. If, if it's in half achieved, no chance, mate. I'm sorry. It's, uh... <laughs> on we go, Steve. No, on a serious note, um, you know, in, in any working day in London, I think we've got something like 14 million people in this city. Um, I think I think I'm right saying I think we've got 38,000 police in London. Am I right? Uh, it's 32,000, just like the listening. It it's nowhere near enough. And my, my question to you, Sir Bernard, is: Have you had a conversation with Mr. Cameron and said, "Look, look, Dave, I need more police. We haven't got enough. I need more." And I'd like to know: Have you had that conversation with him, and what does he say to you, Sir right. Bernard? Well, first of all, I would never call the Prime Minister that name, obviously, Steve, but we, we do have conversations... Have with you government. asked, Prime Minister, I need more men and women? No, any conversation we have with government is private. So, you know, it's a confidential thing that both they would have with us, and I expect to keep the same confidenti confidentiality with them. But you know that I spoke in The Standard a few weeks ago, you've already referred to it, Nick, and I was going cons getting concerned, as I am, for the future of London, given that it's such a growing city, and I saw the police, I can see the police force reducing. And in that context, and of course the terrorist threat that we already know, and all the things that we've got to do, we saw a couple of weeks ago all these protests in London, the students were out, they actually behaved well on the whole, but there was a group within them that didn't. We had the anonymous group out the following night, the previous week we'd had a big rave went wrong in Lambeth, and then we had Remembrance Weekend, which are great events but need to be police. I think in each of those events we had about 1,500 police officers uh, dedicated to it. But to do that we've got to take them out of Barnet. They've got to take them out of Croydon. You know, we haven't got a separate box. When these big things happen, when we have to respond at speed to the events of Paris, I've got to work within the pool of people I've got. We've got 32,000. We so there are gaps now. If you're putting more men and women out there to do counter-terror... Well, the way we're doing it at the moment, Nick, is what we do, we, we call it flex. But what we mean is we pay people overtime, broadly. We How much does that cost, work longer. It costs significant amounts of money. It'll already cost a few hundred thousand. It'll go into millions over the, the next few weeks. So as an emergency service, our best way of responding to emergencies, if it's a big one, is to ask the people we've got to work longer and harder. And that's what we do, and they're very good at it, and they, that's where we, we sort of make this thing work. We know that public, you know, um, public spending is tight. We're not immune to that. But I've said if we could keep at least 30,000 cops, I can make this city safe. If it drops below that, I start to get worried. Even post Paris, you can keep the city safe with yeah, thirty thousand. I, mean, I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, I'd love to have forty thousand. Yeah. I'd love to have five hundred thousand. But in reality, money is tight. So I've said and I don't want to lose any, but we think we can make it work at thirty. And when it comes to keeping the city safe, who's more difficult to identify, Commissioner? Homegrown terrorists or people who've sneaked into this country? Uh, on the whole, you talk, you, you're more worried, of course, about the ones who sneak in because they, you may not know they're there. You don't know where they are. You don't know who they meet. Um, the ones we've got at home, on the whole. We believe that our security services have got a very good handle on them and we work together hand How in hand. How many are we talking about? 650,000? Well, no, no, we've talked to, you know, it's been common knowledge we've talked to over the uh, years. We don't talk specific numbers, but, you know, 4,000, 3,000, 4,000 people across the United Kingdom, I not see, just in London. Right. Um, but very significant numbers here in London. Um, so, therefore, we've got to keep an eye on them. 
and that demands resources. It's got to be done. What we've all said, you cannot look at all of them, them all of the time. So you've got to prioritise, and we do reasonable things. We try to be proportionate in our monitoring of these people and make sure that we, uh, you know, we, we make sure we know where they are, what they're doing. But as we've seen probably in Paris and Belgium, uh, or France and Belgium, it's not easy to predict where someone who has started becoming radical moves to a position where they're going to do something. Uh, these are not always rational steps that we can logically say, right, we just achieved milestone five, let's go and lock them up. These are difficult decisions, which is why the head of the security service, Andrew Parker, and myself have talked about these are difficult decisions. We believe we're getting them right most of the time, but it's not. It's entirely possible one of them gets through. That's what you saw in numbers on in Paris on Friday of last week. And how concerned should we be about the arrival of potential migrants, as might have been the case in Paris through the Syrian channel? I think what we've got to do is work out the wait for the detail of that case. Um, I think everybody said there's of course there's a risk if you've got porous borders and you've got migrants coming through, there's a risk that terrorists are hidden amongst them, or people who become terrorists get hidden amongst them. There is a risk. But none of us have yet seen clear evidence of that. There's clearly been reporting of it over these last few hours that, in fact, people were found with certain passports, that that passport might have been used uh, in Greece. Well, instead of might have, should we just work out what happened? As a police officer, I just want the facts. And And if it is the facts... Then we'll have to create some new policies, no doubt, or see what it means, because we've got you to work out... Tougher, tougher border control in Europe. Well, certainly, I think, you know, this country's actually got quite good uh, border controls compared to the rest of Europe. As we know, they've got two problems at the moment in Europe. One is you've got millions of people wandering through Europe, and number two is you've got limited control over the borders. But I think what we all are wise to do, I've said that we have analysed what's happened about firearms, so therefore we are making, I hope, a rational and logical response... Let's work out who these people were. They're talking about eight people at least. Who were they? Where did they come from? Did they use other passports? Uh, Who who set them off on this trail? Where did they get the guns from? Where did the ammunition come from? How come they crossed European borders? It would appear with the same ease as a Eurostar train. Well, this is why I think... as they fancied. But I think, Nick, this is where we've got to work. Let's see the facts. But, of course, we think in the UK, this is quite a hard thing to go across borders. You get into continental Europe, driving from Belgium to France is not that big a deal. You know, it's like us going from here to Scotland. You just drive over it, you don't even notice the borders there. And different countries have different Are you a fan of the Schengen Agreement, Commissioner? That's a political thing that I'm not going to get involved in, Mr Ferrari. Um, What I would say is we always want good, secure borders. We want to make sure that those people we want to get out, keep out, they stay out. We want to make sure that the people we want to keep here don't leave the country. If you're if you a fan of borders, crime. you're a fan of borders. You're not a fan of the Schengen Agreement, Commissioner. Uh, I'm a fan of keeping this country safe. I'm a fan, fan of making sure that, for example, like, let me just give you one quick example. If somebody commits a murder today, I want to make sure they don't leave this country so we can arrest them. And equally, if there's a murder from somewhere else, I don't want to come into this country to put in people here in danger. Good, strong borders make sure that we can assess the risk and find out who we want to leave and who we want to enter. Just before the final question from Cameron, a question from me. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn is not a fan of the shoot-to-kill policy. Commissioner, are you? Uh, I don't know what exactly he said, and I don't know what he means by shoot-to-kill. The law is this. The law says that the police and anybody else can use reasonable force, and reasonable force to do one of two or three things. First of all, to stop a crime. Secondly, to arrest somebody who's putting somebody in danger. What it means generally is somebody's life's at risk. Police officers intervene and they know that somebody's got to be armed or otherwise so dangerous and then we have a policy to stop them. Now stop them might mean killing them but we don't have a shoot to kill them policy. But of course in these very difficult circumstances you imagine the officers, we saw some pictures didn't we of the French officers who went to that theatre were going forward and were suddenly shot at. It must have been terrifying. There was one, I thought, incredibly brave officer who, who stood where he was, stood behind a pillar, and he was going to have a go, wouldn't he? Well, what guts does that take? And in those half a second, those few seconds, they need all our support. My officers need to know that we're all behind them, that the decisions they take in that half a second are going to be unencumbered by thoughts that put doubt in the mind. So we work within the law, and we make sure that the people on the other side, the terrorists... Uh, knows that we're as determined as they are, as ruthless as they are. The dis- difference between us, we work within the law. So how unhelpful are comments such as these from Mr Corbyn? Mr Corbyn's got to account for his own statements. I can only make clear we do not have a shoot-to-kill policy. We work within the law, but the officers have some difficult decisions. They deserve all our support. Cameron's in Mitcham for a final question. Cameron? Hello, good morning, Mr Bernard. Um, good morning, Cameron. 
compliments, uh, but I'm not going to go too much into it. Um, straight to the point. Uh, Thank you. Uh, how do you think you would prevent um, suicide bombings? Because to me, it seems a very hopeless case that if someone wanted to go into a public place like Trafalgar Square or anywhere, where there's hundreds of thousands of people um, at one time, and just blow himself up, then it, how do you possibly prevent that? What's the solution to preventing that sort of act? Uh, the best defence, Cameron, I always say, is good intelligence. And people say, what does that mean? I'll tell you what it means is that when we know that John Smith uh, is going to go and kill somebody, we arrest them before they get there. So you don't want to wait till somebody hits you before you react. So our job, together with the intelligence service, is to get intelligence from abroad, from this country, and then keep an eye on them and take them out before they get to that point. So when they buy the explosives, when they're creating the explosives, when they're thinking about getting a gun or they obtain the gun, and over this last year, that's happened on seven occasions when we've intervened in different parts of the country, including London, to keep people safe. Of course, if they arrive at the scene, they've got a bomb on, and all the things that we, the terrible things we know about, it's a very difficult situation. We do have plans, we do have training for this, and we do our best to resolve it, but it's not easy. But your best chance is before they get there, not on the day they arrive. And the Prime Minister talked about those attacks yesterday, Commissioner. I think he said seven attacks, as you've just mentioned. Were any of those on the scale of Paris? No, and I think uh, the Prime Minister confirmed that, which is that uh, there were clearly threats to life. Uh, had we not intervened, we believe that within hours or days that there would have been life lost. So these are dangerous people. This is not, they're thinking about it. This is not, they've got a motivation to do it. This is on the point of doing it. They've usually got hold of some material. Uh, they've got hold of weapons. Uh, and officers have to go and make sure that they don't get away with it. Um, but they're fine decisions, Nate. You know, we can be looking at people for weeks, months, and suddenly you've got to, you, you hope you know when they got hold of a gun. You hope you, that you know when they got hold of precursors to, to bombs. But it's not a perfect science, and that's why we all say it's entirely possible that one day they get through. But to date, uh, we've been successful together. And lastly, I know you've, you've come in essentially to reassure, to make sure Londoners are vigilant, but to reassure them as well. A final message, if you would, Commissioner. Well, first of all, uh, I hope that people are reassured. You know, this is something that happened in France, and particularly we've seen in Belgium. There's clearly a French, Franco, Belgium axis there where you've got people who are, are very, very dangerous, and they've had a series of attacks over the months. So this is something in another country, not ours. But I think it gives us fair warning. It gives us fair planning time. So I hope people are reassured that we are making sensible decisions with government about the right tactics, the right level of involvement, the right level of resourcing uh, to make sure we keep people safe. So you should go about your normal life, as I am, uh, you know, just enjoying life and go to a football match tonight, enjoy it, we're there to keep you safe. Uh, if we ever think there's a particular incident or a particular uh, threat, we will let you know. We know that the threat level is severe, but we are taking reasonable precautions. Uh, the British police, uh, together with security services, are the best in the world, I believe. Uh, we've seen great success over the years, so you should be reassured on that. And I think we all need to make sure that we don't knee-jerk to something that we regret in year five. These are things that can change policing, can change all the way all we live our lives uh, very quickly, and then we could regret them later. So let's just think through this terrible event in Paris and all the things we've seen in Belgium and Par France over the last few months. But let's not overreact. And I think uh, you know, we, should, we will keep people safe, but enjoy your life. That's what we're here for. From my listeners to the men and women working with you, good luck and thank you for coming. You've been listening to the Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Bernard Hogan Howe here on LBC When News is Next. Yeah, no, I, I remember when, um, when Tony Blair was president in office of the European Council back at the end of 2005, um, in a speech to him, I said, you know, why should British uh, taxpayers subsidise a new underground system in Warsaw uh, when, frankly,